Hi guys, it's Elisa at Mo Cottage Home Setting. I've been busy processing my ducks this week, so I have plenty of duck meat and I don't want to keep it all in the freezer because if the power goes out, it's going to get ruined. So the best thing to do is to pressure can it so that it can be shelf stable for a couple of years. So today I'm going to show you how it's done. Pressure canning isn't difficult, but there are a lot of little steps you have to take to get a successful outcome. So I find if you get everything set up and you have everything ready and prepared, that takes the overwhelm out of the process. And if you're like me and you have health challenges, it means you can rest in between the steps as well because you're not juggling too many things at once or racing off to get things while you're in the middle of doing whatever it is you're doing at the time. So to start out, I have a clean work surface and then I set up my canner. If you're canning for the first time and you've got a Presto pressure canner, check out my video in the description below on how to set up your Presto pressure canner. That will give you more in detail, in depth look at how to set up the canner from scratch. If you've got a different canner, then check out your manufacturer's guide and set it up for your canner. This is how I basically set up my canner every time I use it. To take the lid off, I quickly check the handles to make sure they're on nice and tight. I remove all the stuff out of my canner. Make sure the air vent's clear. I can see through that, it's nice and clear. You can also give it a blow. And make sure that it's clear that way as well if you can't see through it. I look at my overpressure plug and I just make sure that it's not stuck or gummed up or anything like that. It's nice and clean and clear and it can move just slightly. And then I look at my air vent lock. I make sure that it's screwed on. You've got to hold both sides and I just make sure it's nice and tight, which it usually is. It's just a quick little check I do and I make sure that it can go up and down and move freely. And then I put a little bit of oil in my hand and I oil the ceiling ring. Making sure my fingers are inside and out. So oil's getting on both sides. There. That just helps to prolong the life of the rubber. And then I place it in the lid of my canner. Now, if you've got an all-American canner, you don't even have to worry about that at all. One cooking rack goes in the bottom of your canner. I put in a quarter of a cup of white vinegar, and that just helps keep the jars clean. And check your manufacturer's guide to see how much water you put in your canner for pressure canning and then put in the amount of water that you need for your canner. My canner needs three quarts. And next is the dial gauge. You place that in with your white ring, your washer and your nut. And just do that out finger tight. I like mine to face my air vent lock so that I can see that it's at pressure and still read what the pressure is. That's ready to go over to the stove top now so it's out of my way and ready to use. I also take my weighted gauge over there as well and just place it next to the stove top so that it's ready to use when I need it and I'm not looking for it. As we're preparing for the production line of canning, before we even get the food out, I have three bowls set up. The first bowl has my rings in it. Now they're clean rings and they're sitting in boiling water. The second bowl has my lids in it and they're in warm water. And that just softens the rubber part of the lid and that will help make the seal work properly. The third bowl has a little bit of vinegar in it. And we have a cloth to go with that because this is what we're going to dip into the vinegar to clean the tops of our jars to make sure that there's no food residue on the jar. So that we get the lid sitting properly without any oils in between so that we get a good seal. The middle stacking tray and tongs can be taken over to the stove top because we don't need them until we're over there. It's really handy to have a magnet so that you can get the lids out of the water and your rings as well. I've got a tool to measure the headspace because when you're canning you need to leave the right amount of headspace 
and it also gets the air bubbles out. And I've got my funnel. All my jars have been washed and they're dry and they're at room temperature because I am cold packing so I don't need to worry about them being hot. And that just takes the pressure off too because you're not in a rush trying to get them packed in while they stay warm. When you're pressure canning, the temperatures get so hot and it's such a high pressure that you need to make sure you're using proper jars that are made especially for pressure canning. These are ball mason jars and when you're using them, you need to check to make sure there's no cracks in them and that the top of the lid, the rim, you run your finger around that to make sure there's no chips out because you want the lid to seal properly and if there's a bit missing out of the jar, the lid can't seal onto that jar. And then it's a waste of the food that's in that jar and you'll have a big mess in your canner. So it's a good idea to check every jar to make sure it's going to be okay. This is what muscovy duck meat looks like. It's quite dark. So this is all duck breast. So we're going to can up all these breasts. And first we need to trim off any fat. So just give it a clean up. A little bit of fat doesn't matter if you miss bits, but try and get off as much as you can because that helps the jars to seal. If there's too much fat in your meat, then the jars may not seal properly because oil doesn't make for a good seal if it gets between the lid and the jar. Dice the meat into approximately one inch square pieces and then we can pack the jars. Press the meat in to try and get rid of any air holes. You want to fit as much meat in there as you can. And with meat, you want one inch headspace at the top. didn't quite make six jars so I'm going to spread the meat evenly so that they're fairly even. Press them in and I'll top them up with some water or you could use bone broth. We filled six jars with meat, so we still have plenty of jars left because my canner takes 16 jars. So we may as well make the most of the canner being on because it's going to use the same amount of electricity, the same amount of water and the same amount of time. So we're going to make up some chickpeas for the rest of the jars because they have the same amount of cooking time. What we need to do for them is we need to measure them dry because they swell up and that makes a big difference when you're canning because you need the right amount of beans for each jar. So what we do is we measure pint jars, we measure half a cup of the dried beans and then we rinse them a few times with water.
remove any discoloured beans if there's any in there. And with the clean funnel, we just fill them up into the jars. Half a cup for each jar. If you're using quart jars, then that's one cup of the dried beans. So we just need to do that a few more times. Then we fill all the jars up with filtered water, leaving one inch headspace in all the jars. You want to get all the air bubbles out of the jars so you give it a little swish around. Now I'm going to do the chickpeas first because I don't want to put any meat into the chickpeas because that wouldn't be very hygienic. Just keep that a swish around and all the air bubbles will come to the top. I've got two different types of chickpeas today. So some are big and some are small. It'll be interesting to see how they turn out. I haven't used the small ones before. I normally only use the big ones. With the meat, you go along the side and you squeeze it in and the water will go down considerably. So we will have to top them up again. So this is your measuring tool for headspace. We want one inch, which is the first step. Just a little bit more. Next measure the meat headspace. Okay, so we need to take some of that liquid out. Dip your cloth into the vinegar and we're going to wipe the seal nice and clean to make sure there's no excess oil or food and that will help to get a good seal which I've talked about a few times in this video already because obviously that's the most important thing I mean apart from hygiene and the right headspace we really want to have a good seal because otherwise everything else we've done will be a waste of time because the lid won't seal and sometimes you can still eat the food if the seal hasn't sealed but if it spoils completely then all right then we use the dry part of the cloth and wipe it dry beautiful get the excess water off your lid and then center it onto the jar place a ring on and just do it finger tight. You don't need to do it up too tight. You just want it done up to hold it in place. It's one jar done. Center the lid. And place a can ring on finger tight. Use the vinegar side of your cloth, the dry part of the cloth. Get the excess water off your lid, center your lid onto the jar, place your can and ring on finger tight. I'm going to use a different cloth now for the chickpeas.
Well, the jars are in the canner, the lid's on in locked position so it's nice and secure and safe. The heat's on medium high, warming up the canner and I've made sure the canner is centered to the hot plate at the bottom so that it's not sort of half on or half off or anything like that, it's in central. Okay, so now we're just going to wait for some steam to come out. When it's a steady stream of steam, then we're going to start timing it for 10 minutes. And so we'll be venting it for 10 minutes. We have a steady stream of steam coming out now. So we're going to put the timer on for 10 minutes and just let that vent for 10 minutes. That's popped up now too. It's been venting for 10 minutes now. So we're going to put our weighted gauge on and let the canner build up pressure. To work out how much weights you need on your weighted gauge will depend on the altitude you're at. So find out your altitude. If you're below 1,000 feet, then you need to use 10 pound weighted gauge. And if you're above 1,000 feet, use 15. If you're using your dial gauge and you're below 2,000 feet, then you have it at 11. And that's where I have mine at when I'm pressure canning. If you're above, it goes up in increments. So it can be 12, 13, 14. It just depends where you are as far as altitude. So work at your altitude, check the book to work out what you need to be looking at and where you need your dial gauge at or your weighted gauge at. I like to write a few things down when I'm canning. Because I'm canning duck meat and chickpeas, the time is 75 minutes when you're using pint jars. If I was using quart jars, it would be 90 minutes. I write down 11 because that's what I want my dial gauge to be set at. So dial gauge is at 11. I write down start time and I write down the end time. The can has just built up pressure. It's now at 11 on the dial gauge. You can hear that jiggler going off. And my start time is 12.17, so my end time is going to be 1.32. Now I always write this down because you can forget where you're at when you're canning. That comes very mundane and if you're doing a lot of canning, you can forget which time you're supposed to be remembering. I also set the alarm, so I've got that as a backup to remind me as well. The most important thing now is to keep an eye on the canner and make sure the canner doesn't go below the pressure you need it to be for the whole processing time. If it drops below the pressure, and I'll use mine as an example, 11, if it, for me, if it goes below 11, I need to start my processing time from the beginning and start my 75 minutes from when it gets back up to 11 for the whole time. If it drops below, then whatever I've done already doesn't count. Even if I've done 74 minutes, it's not gonna count. It's really important that you do this because you don't wanna get anybody sick. Botulism is a thing that can get into cans if you don't do it properly and you can't see it, you can't smell it. So you don't want to make anybody sick, make sure you process properly and it's easy if you just keep an eye on the canner and the pressure. You can hear the jiggler going so you know that that's, that's going well as well. So don't go off and do the washing or answer the front door or get chatting to somebody, you need to be focused. So it's not hard, it's just really important that you do that for good safety purposes. When you're starting out canning or you're using a new stove top to can, you've got to work out where the sweet spot is on your stove top and where it is. What I do is once I've worked it out, I have a, a black marker that's an oil-based paint texture and I put a little dot where the sweet spot is so every time I can I can just set it to that temperature and I know that that's the good spot. Today I'm using this stove top for the very first time because we needed a new oven and we got the new oven so now the, the door closes on that so it's really exciting. So now I've just got to find the sweet spot for this particular stove top when I'm canning and then I can put my little black mark on so next time I'll be right. Our time's up, so now we turn the heat off and we let the canner cool down and so it depressurizes. Don't be tempted to touch a jiggler and let the steam out quicker because depressurizing your canner too quickly 
can crack jars or not let them seal properly and you could have breakages and you don't want that. So just be patient and I know that can be hard because you're so excited and you want to see what's going on in your canner. But trust me, wait, be patient. So we're going to let this get down to zero pressure and then we're going to wait five minutes after that as well. So that's a lot of patience. While you're waiting for your canner to cool down, set up an area out of reach where no one's going to touch it for your jars to cool down for at least 12 hours. Now they're not allowed to be disturbed and you don't want anyone to burn themselves. So make sure it's out of reach of little ones as well. Put a board down so that the jars are not going to damage any countertops because they are really hot and they will take the paint off anything. It's a good idea just to get into the habit of putting a cloth down because if it's a cold top, then the hot jars could crack when you put it onto the cold surface. Also, if the jars are a little bit sticky or messy, then it just saves time cleaning up as well. That took 50 minutes to lose pressure and now we've got to wait another five minutes and then we can take the lid off and have a look. You can take your weighted gauge off now. It's been five minutes and we can take the lid off too. Now when you're taking the lid off, you've got to be careful because obviously it's still going to be hot and there's going to be steam coming out. So you want to open it away from you. So open the lid and watch out for any dripping water, especially if you're like me and have no shoes on. Have somewhere to put the hot lid where you're not going to ruin the dial gauge. Now we're going to leave it another 10 minutes and then we can get the jars out. That's the sound you want to hear, all those lids popping. They're sucking in and hopefully sealing beautifully. When you're transporting your hot jars from the can, keep them steady and upright and watch out for any dripping water. They smell really good, but now we have to wait 12 hours and we're not to touch them. Don't play with the rings or be tempted to move them around and have a look. Grab a cuppa and sit and watch them bubble for a little while before you get into the next job. Once your candy lid's cooled down, then you can take your dial gauge off. It's a good idea to get that put away nice and safe back in the box. What I do is I get a tissue and make sure there's no water or steam left in there. Then I put on my washers and my nut. And then I'm ready to put it back in the bubble wrap and in the box and I'll put it somewhere safe until the canner is clean and then I put it in the canner up on the top shelf. Remove your rubber if you have a Presto pressure canner and then you can wash your canner up. Wait until your canner's cooled down enough before you start moving it around with boiling water in it. It's not so bad with pressure canning because it's quite light, but if you're water bath canning then it can be a little bit tricky and it's probably a good idea to label some of the water out but definitely wait for it to cool down a bit. It's ready to get washed up, dried and put away. I love getting up the morning after canning and coming into the kitchen to see how the jars have worked out. We have a 100% success rate. They're all sucked in, they're sealed properly. So now we get to take the rings off, which come off quite easily because we didn't do them up too tight. The lids are on nice and tight, sucked in 
and now we just need to wash the jars up because there can be food residue on the outside and if you don't wash it off properly using soap and warm water, you don't want to have it too hot or too cold, just, just lukewarm water and a bit of soap and we'll get that residue off because when you're canning there can be siphoning, um, some of the food residue can come out of the jars and get into the water, the, the vinegar and water and although the vinegar does help keep the, the jars clean, depending on what you're canning, you, you know, you can have more residue. Um, so it's a good idea to get that off, otherwise you'll get mould on your jars and that is not great. But I have a video on that, I'll leave that in the description below, so if you want to see that video, check that out too. When the jars are washed and dry, write on the lid with the texture, what's in the jar and the date you canned it. Now the jars can last for, the manufacturers say 12 months, but the new canning lids are saying 18 months. Now I have got some meat jars that are over three years old and they are fine. It's a good idea to store them out of direct sunlight and in a fairly stable environment. And that's not always possible and that's not really what I do either. Store your jars singly. It's a great thing if you're able to have shelves that are perfect for each jars with a bit of space so you can see what's going on with your jar lids. But don't be storing them on top of each other because the weight can actually affect the seal if you've got too much weight on a jar lid. And also you can't see what's going on. So if a seal does break, which it can occasionally happen, I've never had that happen myself, but it can happen. You want to be able to see what's going on and you don't want bad food in your pantry. That's the reason I don't store my rings on my jars as well because that can create a fake seal. You think it's sealed, it's holding the lid on, but in fact it's not sealed if it's popped. So you can think it's sealed because it's in place. Someone might grab it out and they don't know what they're looking for. They're not looking for an indentation. They think it's sealed. So don't store them with your rings on. I know some people like to. And if you really have to, just put it on loosely and make sure you check them. But it, look, it's a good idea just to leave them off. It doesn't matter. It's not holding the lid on. As you can see, the lid is on. If it's on, it's on. As you saw, the meat went into the jar raw. It is now cooked. You could just eat this straight from the jar. It's better heated up though. It's great in casseroles and pastas. You can have it in toasted sandwiches. It's just really quick and easy. You don't have to worry about defrosting. You just need to flip the lid and you can start using it. So it's great when you're running out of time or you haven't got anything prepared out of the freezer. And it's good if you don't have electricity too. And although canned meat doesn't look pretty, home canned meat is really tender and juicy and full of flavor. So it's quite surprising. And if I didn't mention already, the only thing with keeping the jars for longer than the 18 months or 12 months, depending on your lids, is that the food will lose nutritional value over time. So the longer you leave it, say three or four years down the track, if it's still sealed, good to go, it will have lost some nutritional value. That is the only thing, which obviously we want as much nutrient packed food as we can get, but it's still an option. For storing food long term without using electricity and you're not reliant on having the power on and a freezer full of meat so much because power goes out, okay. And that's if you've even got electricity. I hope I've covered enough information so that I can get started on canning meat, chickpeas or just canning it all. If you want to see what we're doing on our small space homesteading channel and learn other skills that we do here, then check out our other videos subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.